All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. We have some new faces in the studio today. We had Nicole and Jessa, fourth year students from MUSC. What's going on? Hey Ladies, guys. how are y'all? Hello, everyone. Good. How are good. you? Good, good. Y'all finally made it onto this podcast. And finally. The, the All f- your finally. dreams. <laughs> like yes. the fourth week of rotation. I know. What was happening this other three weeks? I, oh, well, first well, th- first thing, my, my son was born early, so that uh, threw a damper in our schedule as far as after after clinic uh, what was he extravaganzas. Thinking? What was he thinking? Yeah, so we've not been publishing a lot uh, of episodes this month, but that's, that's my excuse. I think the listeners will forgive us. I don't know. I hope so. Well... Sick Jackson on him if they, if they yeah, don't. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's been pent up in that hospital for too long. He's ready for action. So, Nicole, Jessa, you got a couple, what, six, seven months left of school, roughly. What's the what's on the docket for next year? What are you guys thinking? What are your future plans? Do you know yet? Great question. Um. <laughs> if you don't know, that's cool. I don't know what I'm going to be doing, I feel like, next year either. <laughs> What, Je- Nicole, you go first. Okay. What do you think? Um, what, do you, what do you want to do? What's, what's your, what would you, perfect situation, what would you want to do? I mean, I do, I love um, having patient interactions. So I definitely want a job where I can um, interact with patients on a daily basis. Um, I think that drives me, I'd say. Could you see yourself going Amcare route eventually? Maybe? Um, I, I mean, Or more yeah. community? I, I do I do like Amcare, so that that is definitely like a big possibility for me. So. Cool, Jessa. Yeah, and as for me, I've been working in a um, outpatient pharmacy as an intern, so mm-hmm. um, that's where I wanted to go. But I'm still open with opportunities that come. So Jessa, how uh, how long have you been in the states? <laughs> We're not getting there. Oh, we're getting um, there. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I'm here. I came here around 2015 of December. So it's been a while that I'm in school. <laughs> I, I feel like most of us are nervous to go to like a new school in like a city that we probably maybe either are familiar with or, you know, grew up in or whatever. Um, how is that like completely going across the world to a different country to go to school? Is that super scary? Exciting? It was scary coming all the way here. And there's this funny story that I, I came here around when I was 19 years old. And then when I came to the airport, I was all alone. And then they thought that I was lost and they were looking for my parents. It's like, that was just funny because they always think. I thought you were a child. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just, I get the same thing all the time. People are like, are you 19 or younger? And I go, no, I'm a grown 35 year old man or however old I am. I believe you. I Thank I believe you. you. <laughs> I'm 34. I'm not 35. Like you're not 35. No, I'm 34. Thank you, Cole. I appreciate that. She's got to give you that extra year. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. It's good for my ego. All right. So today we're going to do things a little bit differently. We haven't done a patient case. Um, I say differently, like we've never done this before. Um, we haven't done a patient case in a while. And so um, we're going to kind of go through this more uh, potentially elaborate patient that we actually saw in clinic. Um, it's a pretty this, specialized patient. It is. And it's actually something that we have referred to GI before for this. Patient just, just he's like, nah, I didn't go. That was literally verbatim, the comment that we made when we asked him if he'd follow up. He goes, nah. I said, okay. Okay, <laughs> so here he's came to me. Instead of getting a specialist, he's now going to get a few clinical pharmacists trying their best. <laughs> he's going to get the Corvino treatment. So, uh, so basically, this is a 56-year-old um, Hispanic female patient who came to the clinic for a follow-up appointment, even though she was supposed to be seen at uh, GI. Past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis C without coma, depression, and Tourette syndrome. Um, the patients uh, shared that she has gotten out of the hospital three days, or she was just gotten out of the hospital, discharged from the hospital three days ago. Um, and according to her daughter, um, who you know takes care of her as her primary caregiver, um, they were concerned because she was disoriented, confused, couldn't you know speak right. According you know that's her direct quote, and um, immediately brought her to the emergency room where they diagnosed her with hepatic encephalopathy. Um, she was given lactulose, 30 ml QID, and um, she's complaining about constipation, insomnia. Um, but aside from that, she definitely looks better. Her mental status is somewhat improved. Um, definitely not completely um, 
taking care of her back to baseline mm-hmm. cognitively. But um, and then during rounding, while she was still in the hospital, the patient uh, explained that she's having excessive itching um, during the night, and uh, is, that made her insomnia worse. And that's kind of continued now in the outpatient setting. So today, her blood pressure is actually. Um, pretty controlled. Uh, she has um, a BMI of 21.04 and uh, EGFR is 71, um, a glucose of 103, but she had just eaten when we had her CMP taken. Um, our LFTs, we have an AST of 284 and an ALT of 204. So mm, her fibroshore came back because we also did the hep C workup. Um, her fibrosis score on, on the fibro score was a 0.71. Um, necroinflammatory activity score was 0.84. And if you, if you look at her platelets, um, they were also, I believe, like 120-ish. So um, definitely all signs point from a fibro shore standpoint um, to cirrhosis, which um, she had a previous history of anyway. Um, no ascites present, but there was hepatic encephalopathy. Um, no history of esophageal varices or um, anything to that extent that we know of. However, we haven't been sent her. She hasn't, hasn't been, been to v, hasn't been to uh, GI to actually look look currently to see if there's anything present. So, we think it's a child P score uh, A, which would be compensated cirrhosis. However, there's still um, some concern that uh, maybe. She's, um, spe- you know, especially with the new onset of hepatic encephalopathy, that uh, there there could be um, at least a, a quick turnaround for decompensated cirrhosis. And so ideally, this patient needs to be treated uh, by a specialist. Um, and this is one that we typically wouldn't handle from a hep C standpoint. And, uh, you know, we would try to get them in with a specialist who's also in contact with transplant potentially as well. But um, that's kind of the gist of... Uh, the patient. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other, um, things as well, but, um, what do you guys want to start as far as, you know, her liver disease? Anything you want to go through her, uh, medications, Nicole? Yeah. So, um, she's currently being treated for her hypertension with lisinopril 10 milligrams daily, um, as well as her depression with sertraline 150 milligrams daily. Uh, for her Tourette's syndrome, she's getting risperdone 0.5 milligrams daily. Uh, she was referred to MESC um, gastro for further management of her um, cirrhosis and chronic hep C. Um, for her new hepatic encephalopathy, um, she was treated with the lactulose 30 milliliters QID. Um, her, she, for her insomnia, she's using um, z over-the-counter nighttime sleep aid. Um, for her constipation, she's also treating over-the-counter with Prunilax. And for her GER, she's doing Nexium 40 milligrams daily. And for her cholesterol, um, atorvastatin 20 milligrams daily. All right. So, um, what do you th- I mean, her insomnia medication, probably not ideal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, basically just diphenhydramine, it's definitely yeah. not something we should be doing long term. Yeah. Um, we also got a patient with cognitive issues from the <laughs> exactly definitely not, not uh, ideal. a good first generation a uh, high dose first generation in um and is not not ideal yeah um and then uh what is that um you said uh what was the um constipation medicine she was on prune prunulax prunulax is that a real i've never heard of that Have I, you cool? I, I, no. is, that like a, is that a brand, is a special brand name is it just a stimul laxative i guess it's just prune juice that they've that, that this is i'm guessing prune juice that they've branded and patients pay a lot for you know what, that's dude? what i think say. you're right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so yeah well that makes sense um, okay, so we'll come back to some of those in just a little bit. But uh, what about her hepatic encephalopathy? So she's on lactulose. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that at all? Anything in particular? Yeah, I mean, like I know with for her lactulose, especially with hepatic encephalopathy, um, there is um, a buildup of um, ammonia in the body. So with the lactulose, since it's a non-absorbable disaccharide, so it's not absorbed in her small intestine, and it's able to go to the large intestine where bacteria actually metabolize the lactulose and end up converting the ammonia to ammonium, in which essentially the patient um, doesn't have that ammonia buildup and um, cause that. Um, which is part of what causes the um, like neuropsychiatric disease. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's important to note that while w- that we blame ammonium, ammonia, um, it's really not well understood why the encephalopathy, ha- encephalopathy happens. Um, they, they blame ammonia. 
Um, they blame changes related to inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA and serotonin, um, maybe impairment of excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate and catecholamines, uh, and um, using lactulose and getting rid of some of the ammonia seems to help. And so that points towards that. But yeah, I, I think it's interesting that it's not well understood. And what is it just for uh, those not super familiar with encephalopathies? It's basically neuropsychiatric changes um, that are caused by the liver failing. And so they're going to they're going to have cognitive issues and um, various different things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the question that kind of came up when we had this patient at clinic was, okay, they got lactulose, they're stable on this. And you also will see lactulose sometimes used as like an osmo uh, osmotic laxative as well. So hopefully they can get rid of that prune something or other. Um, <laughs> prune <laughs> prune <laughs> it's a dietary prune supplement. Yeah. I just looked yep. it up. Okay. Comes so, in tablet form. Oh, well, finally. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, basically the, the thought is, you know, that can help with that. In some, you know, that can kind of two, kill two birds with one stone. But the, the question that came up was, what about Zyfaxin? Because um, it's an antibiotic that's kind of primarily stays in the gut. Um, and there's several studies, five in particular randomized trials that have looked at um, Zyfaxin for hepatic encephalopathy um, specifically. And we, we kind of think of that more for like, at least in my primary care mind um like traveler's diarrhea or for ibs with diarrhea for the first couple of weeks of treatment and then getting on something more stable but um the hepatic encephalopathy indication is something that it's definitely widely known for i think it was actually its first indication if i remember correctly uh, but there's five randomized control trials. One in particular that uh, I have here is um, they compared the combination of Zyfaxin and lactulose with lactulose alone in 120 patients that were hospitalized um, that had over hepatic encephalopathy. They were followed um, until they were discharged from the hospital or the patients died. Um, patients who received the combo were more likely than those who received lactulose monotherapy to have complete resolution of their hepatic encephalopathy. It was 76 versus 44% and a lower mortality rate. Um, and a, a meta-analysis of 19 trials showed that the uh, Zefaxin has a beneficial effect on hepatic encephalopathy and also may reduce mortality according to that. So definitely has some good um, data kind of backing it up. There's also um, some evidence with neomycin, but I think that that's one we would, at least I'm not familiar enough with, with that to even go down that rabbit hole. So um, uh, the Zyfaxin was definitely one that we felt comfortable with, like at least getting started until right. GI can step in. And you'll see lactulose recommended first line and some guidelines and things and that's mostly related to cost if cost isn't an issue then for the reasons mike mentioned zyvaxin is is really first line and the the reason behind it is interesting because they're different types of drugs right um zyvaxin is also poorly absorbable but um it reduces gut flora gut bacteria that can lead to uh, that can result in um neurotoxins that kind of derive from the gut and so killing a lot of that is thought to help with uh, encephalopathy and turns out it does yeah. So the, the next thing we had to deal with was getting these Zyfaxin covered um, by the insurance. So the patient did have insurance, which was nice, um, but uh, we had to do a full prior authorization. And the first thing they asked was, is the patient established on lactulose? Mm -hmm. So if we hadn't gone that route first, we would you know need to prove that they had tried that and still have, were having symptoms, which this patient was. Or had a reason they couldn't use lactulose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, But we kind of just showed the records, showed that we had tried that already. Um, patient had been hospitalized, hit long history of hepatic disease, and uh, I think we got it covered within like a few minutes. Yeah. Someone had authorized it, and patient was able to get it. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, now that I'm looking at it, this is one that our group does, Ms. FX. Is it? For GI, yeah. Quit bragging, Cole. I, well, I mean, you know, they just do that piece. The Guys, he's so, he issue. thinks he's so cool. I'm just saying. With his specialty <laughs> meds. Pretty much if there's a cost issue, it probably means that we deal with it. Yeah. Which is yeah. Zyfaxin. So uh, what do you guys want to go next? So that's an option, Zyfaxin. They're on um, lactulose. Um, and uh, it might kind of laid out the data that's behind it. And there's other things that you can use Zyfaxin for. But for the most part, I think this is probably the the most common thing right so what else do we have for encephalopathy i think maybe the monitoring part like maybe just make sure that the mental status is improved okay yeah so monitor for her psychiatric changes uh, yeah. and uh yeah see if that improves definitely 
The, the other thing, I guess, with speaking of his uh, hepatic disease, I guess we could touch on is um, what we would, you know, kind of le- need to do going forward if we were going to treat his hep C, especially, again, we're going to re- re-refer him to uh, or her to um, GI. But mm-hmm. hypothetically, if we were going to continue forward and, and treat this patient, um, the you know, compensated cirrhosis, um, in, in that case, you know, the ideal, in my opinion, the ideal treatment would be Clusa because we wouldn't have to worry about the protease inhibitor that's in Maverick in case that she kind of transition to decompensated cirrhosis. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit longer of a treatment option um, as far as 12 weeks versus eight, but the pill burden is not as extensive. And, you know, we would um, probably be better off with Clusa just overall from a safety standpoint. Now, uh, if the patient did, for whatever reason, have uh, decomp, you know, if they progressed, they had, we established they had decompensated cirrhosis. Again, we wouldn't actually be handling this, but just for discussion's sake, yeah. um, at that point, we could still do the twelve week regimen, but we'd have to add it in ribavirin, which can definitely add a, a wrench into things as far as adverse effects and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if we didn't, if we had a contraindication to ribavirin or some reason we couldn't do that, we'd have to just extend the therapy for the Epclosa for the 24 weeks, regardless of genotype, which is pretty nice, except with if it's genotype 3, um, which I don't believe this patient has genotype 3. I think it was 1A. Um, but if it was 3, then we would potentially need to do resistance testing Um because three can be resistant for those more severe, more advanced liver disease patients. And has she been tested for um, Hep B and all that sort of the the kind of preliminary workup? No, and that's good. So, um, I, did we have her serologies on here? Uh, we did, but um, it looks like she was not tested for Hep B. Okay. At that time, yeah. So that's a, a very very important. It's actually part of the box mm-hmm. warning for the for Eclose and Maverick is we need to at the very very least get a uh, surface antigen because if that is positive and that shows that um, the patient most likely has an acute Hep B infection and we do not want to cause a acute Hep B flare up while they're also treating Hep C because that that can happen if you start a Hep C medication um, when they have an acute flare up of Hep B. So in that case we would have to get a DNA viral load. Um, and then potentially suppress the Hep B for that 12 weeks while they're on the Epclusa with something like tenofovir alafenamide, and then maybe 12 weeks after as well. Uh, but again, that's why we would want GI involved, so we're not having to do that, you know, solo in primary care. Pretty we, complex we, for primary we'd care. We'd be yeah. way over our heads. <laughs> um, the other thing is when we get the serology for Hep B serologies, we go ahead and get the, the surface antigen, the surface antibody, and the core antibody. Because the core antibody shows more of like a past infection that's you know, dormant or resolved. And then uh, the surface antibody shows like immunity towards from vaccination. So it kind of gives us an idea of whether or not the patient needs to receive the Hep B vaccination if they haven't already. And then we'll also get hepatitis A, total antibody, and IgM. So the IgM is more of the acute. Um, the IgG is the, the chronic. So if the total is positive and the IgM is negative, we know that it's the resolved infection so um, we need to get those two but definitely more importantly the, the hep b is this like we have to get that as far as the box warning goes right or we would get in trouble right with the fda so hypothetically we add up clusa so what what adjustments would we have to make to her med regimen because there's a couple interactions right yeah mm-hmm. you uh you want to start us off since you got it pulled up, I'm still probably going to pull them up. Uh. <laughs> sure. So the two that come to mind, um, there's a number of interactions that come to mind with hep C drugs, um, mm. antiepileptic drugs, um, statins, um, acid-reducing agents, some antibiotics, that sort of thing. So she's on atorvastatin and Nexium, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so in certain situations, I think uh, certain statins would be contraindicated. Is resuvastatin contraindicated with Eclusa. Which one? Resuvastatin. No, it's up 10 milligrams is the max. Okay, 10 milligrams is the max. Atorvastatin can go down to 10 milligrams. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Okay. So for her, we could decrease it to 10 milligrams, so right? Basically, Atorva is like starting at the lowest dose possible and then monitor from okay. there. So yeah, with the you probably would want to go down a little bit and then monitor. Resuva actually says 10 milligrams is kind of like the cutoff. Gotcha. Um, and then I see Brian Gilbert's question from LinkedIn. He says, what was the INR talking about the cirrhotic patient? So I believe, I don't know if we have it here. I think it's a 1.2, 1.3. So yeah, it was, it was up there a little bit. Sorry if you guys hear our dog barking. He won't shut up and my wife's just <laughs> letting him bark. Part of the episode forever and ever. Perfect. Love Colby so much. Hope he gets to stay in our house for the rest of my life. Um, and, uh, so the other thing would be his Nexium. Uh, PPIs being, and when you lower the, uh, 
the acidity or, or raise the pH of the stomach, um, you decrease the um, solubility of the medication, which means your absorption is not going to be as good. Now, they say ideally not to use a PPI at all, but if you have to, for whatever reason, the patient just cannot live without a PPI, probably not the case for this patient. Mm -hmm. But if that was the case, then um, they they recommend omiprazole, 20 milligrams max, and they want it four hours after the Eplosa. Um So that's... The, that's got the best data as far as making sure the drug is still efficacious and the patient's still treated. However, ideally, no PPI would yep. be even more ideal. Mm-hmm. And she's not taking other um, acid-reducing agents, but there are other recommendations for H2RAs and acids like Tums. Those are easy to separate by four mm-hmm. hours, but just keep an eye on those for any patient starting on one of these meds. Yeah. Sweet. What else we got, guys? Um, what else do we have in this patient? Anything besides her liver disease? Um, do we talk about anything else? What do we got? What about the itching? Yeah, yeah. What do y'all think, ladies? What do you guys have for the itching? So for her cholest- cholestatic pruritus. Yes. That's what we're calling it. See, we call it, we call it itching because we <laughs> can't pronounce big words. <laughs> right. Itching. So I know, um, usually for that, I know the pathogenesis usually unknown, but usually the most common hypothesis is that it's due to an accumulation of bile acids, which can trigger a histamine release from the mast cells. Um, I heard it typically tends to occur more in the nighttime, especially when it's hot. Mm. Um, So I think for the patient trying to keep them cool during the nighttime is probably important as well. Some therapy options could be like cholestyramine, cholestipol, or the cholestyramine. Interesting. So the bile acids are questions. Well call. Exactly. For well itching. call, yes. <laughs> and it is hot in Charleston. It yes. is. hot right yeah. now. I feel like I'm getting this as we speak. Like my, I know, I know. My air conditioning, non, pretty much non-existent at this point. It works, but it's so hot it takes, I mean, in my 20-minute commute, it doesn't even get cold enough to make it dance. Oh, dude. I, so the second... I get in my car, it's max AC, and I want it to be so cold I have pneumonia by the oh, time I, I, listen, get, I, I max get it out, I recirculate the air, max as cold as it can possibly get, but my truck is from 2006. I well, mean, listen, it's probably hanging on to a slash. Whose fault is that? There's probably three mLs of Freon in there. That's, okay? We need to supercharge that thing. I know. Um, it's yeah. hot. The, uh, the other thing I thought was interesting was... Um, yeah, they say to avoid drying lotions like mm-hmm. calamine, calamine lotion, you know, things like that, mm-hmm. which I feel like um, a lot of times people end up using calamine lotion when it's when you have itching. Um, yeah. Have you ever uh, though? I guess that's true. But usually wouldn't it be if they've like got a visible rash of some sort? Like does, does this create anything visible or is it just the itching? I think it's itching, but I think it could people have do, some redness probably mostly from that histamine right. release and the actual I guess people, itching. I guess people could do that, yeah. yeah. But that's interesting, yeah. But uh, calamine lotion is one of those things where it's like it's around still, but for no good reason. Yeah. Because if you have like poison ivy, like people put it all over, it spreads it all over your body. <laughs> Chicken pox spreads it everywhere. And it's just like there's not a good, at least according to me, tell me if I'm wrong, people in the comment section. But uh, I feel like there's no like solid like this is why we have so this. So what do you boom. do if you have poison ivy? Me? Yeah. Have I told this story on the podcast? I, I don't know, but I can't wait okay, to hear it. Okay, well, just listen. Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. So I went on a camping trip when I was in, like, seventh grade. Mm-hmm. Okay. Off to a good start. Don't often <laughs> bathe or shower on a camping trip. Must have gotten into some poison ivy. Slept. Uh, obviously touched my face, legs, arms, every single part of my body. <laughs> Break out all over the place, especially my face. It was blown up like a balloon. You seen Lord of the Rings? Ah, uh, yeah. Orc face. I mean, that's what well, I had. I I went to football practice for whatever reason and couldn't get with the orc face. With orc face to, to intimidate. This people. is probably after four days of orc face. I oh went to gosh, football yeah. practice. You couldn't, wouldn't want to go to the doctor. Couldn't even get my. I actually did not go to the doctor. Yeah. Couldn't get my helmet on because my to. my face was so swollen. Uh, so I needed some relief, which I guess it would have made sense to go to the doctor and maybe get, no, I don't know just what don't wear a helmet. I could have just not worn a helmet. That's the key. So like, what are you going to do? You know, what did you do? You, you, yeah. I, I just sat I there, to the I sat there with person. a wet, wet rag on my face when my dad laughed at me. That was well, pretty much what I did. That's pretty standard dad <laughs> and behavior. Took, and they took pictures of me. I'm not going to lie. I'd <laughs> laugh at you to this day. If you sat there with a rag and I'd be like, why don't you go to the doctor? Uh, that's well, I was a child, so well, my mom would have had to take me to the doctor. Okay. Well, Mrs. Swanson, that's not okay <laughs> that you did not take your son to the doctor. <laughs> if I do say so now, I guess I could have gotten a steroid or something, but probably used uh, calamine lotion, I'd imagine. Well, since we're telling the stories about uh, allergic reactions and things like that, kind of, um, I told you guys about the uh, time when Jen had touched something at the uh, at Costco and touched her eye and got that horrible, like, 
conjunctive <laughs> allergic conjunctivitis where her like entire sclera was like bubbled up. Oh my yeah. gosh. And and I usually got a real nice poker face when something bad's happening. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, no, nah, everything's fine for her sake. And in my, in my even on my mind I'm going, Oh no, oh no. Normally I'm real good about that. This time I looked and I was so shocked at her eye, the way it looked like a cartoon. It was I was like <laughs> What and could she have touched? I have yeah. no clue. We never figured out it or duplicated it to this day. Some something in Costco. Of, we've never stepped foot in there. Something that she had an allergic that she's allergic yeah. to, obviously. It's probably Costco pizza that, that, yeah, that Nicole so fond of. That's, <laughs> that's good stuff. Right. Right. Yeah, well, we had a, we had a long debate about this. I'm a Costco person now. Um <laughs> but I used to be a Sam's person. Oh. Definitely the elevated. Nathan's hot dogs at Sam's do beat costco mm -hmm. but i still get the hot dogs at costco so basically cole before you get into your hot dog story we gotta finish mine and then we'll get back oh, to the, the hot dog story's case. done that was it <laughs> okay good um no so we go to the urgent care place and i see the pa who's, who's administering vigamox in her eye okay and i'm like why the heck is he doing that we didn't at this point we hadn't said anything he never asked us what we did or anything and so uh I'm, he's putting i'm like what the heck is he doing vigamox for mm -hmm. that's not doesn't seem to be a good method. And uh, then he asked what we do for a living, whatever, while he was kind of like waiting for the Vigamox to start mm -hmm. working. And we're like, oh, we're pharmacists. He was like, oh, <laughs> drops all professionalism and just starts, you know, talking with us, like, get just like we're best friends. And I was like, man, I got to ask you something. Cause he was, you know, cool guy. He was like 67. He's just, you know, chilling at urgent care. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what was it? The Vigamox? He goes, oh, this. And he holds up, he goes, nothing. I just wanted her to feel more comfortable. He goes, I said, Pernicilla. I dropped to the pharmacy. Oh, <laughs> I said, yes, dude. That was the most. Awesome decoy of all time. I respect that. <laughs> just the way he looks. He just, looks just, oh, pff, I don't know, nothing. Wanted, wanted a little placebo <laughs> Wanted its placebo the effect. I said, was dude, ready. I like it. I like that a lot. All right. Anyways, that's my that's our story that has nothing to do with anything. So <laughs> We'll have to talk offline about this Costco pizza, though, because yeah. I do also like the Costco well, pizza. Well, honestly, it's going to cost Nicole her rotation grade. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get one. I've never tried oh, the Costco. So you don't want oh, to. You'll yeah. you'll want. You'll never no. come back to America again. Just do, just, just do what my wife did and take a paper towel, mm -hmm. pat off some of the grease. That's, right. what, that's what I said. Just a little bit of the grease, and it's good stuff. Yeah. Well, it's good. You're not going to lose food this way. You're not going to eat it and go. I'm glad I did that. Listen. <laughs> it's cheap. It's cheap. That's and it okay. Tastes good. That's the biggest <laughs> thing. So that's why Cole likes. Right. That's the biggest thing because co taste. Uh, is related to cost. High cost, <laughs> it's an inverse relationship between cost and taste buds for me. Okay, really? for you. If You're the only person The more I pay for it, the more my taste buds retreat, the less I pay for it, <laughs> yeah. the more they express. Mine are different. Mine so go, Costco pizza tastes great. Mine go, give me all of it. <laughs> we had this whole long talk about Cole not being willing to buy shrimp for his hibachi chicken because he doesn't want to pay $2 or some nonsense. I still it's, don't do it. It's preposterous. I it makes me so angry. I'm thinking about canceling the whole podcast. I won't call out the place, but um, the hibachi, there's a hibachi place right beside a, a Chinese food place and the and i really like both of Pond these of i love both of these types of foods but i know that this chinese place is like terrible like it just is not good chicken that their chicken's got a giant c on the door so much breading grade. it just doesn't taste very good yeah but a meal from there and a meal from the hibachi place is a two dollar difference oh my and so gosh this is gonna make me so angry so every three months or so i forget how bad their chicken is and i'm like oh, two dollars i can't spend this extra two dollars on hibachi and i go to this chinese place and i get really upset at how bad the chicken is of course every time and about three months later i'll you're do it again cat. you're eating house cat well, most likely that is it's not very good chicken it's two dollars we could yeah. you could find two dollars. You can go get a friend and go get a fifty no. cents each, and we will be fine. That, dude, we are starting a GoFundMe. <laughs> this podcast now has a GoFundMe for Cole, so he can get chicken for once in his life that doesn't taste like disgustingness. Yeah. It's he not. Can flash his Venmo account. Yeah. Exactly. Well, if, if any just, of you have two dollars for, it'll be in the show notes. If any of you listeners have three dollars to spend for there poor for poor Cole to eat like an adult. <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. Oh, so, uh, patient is on, yeah, obvious transition now. <laughs> patient is on, uh, you know, the lisinopril, but blood pressure is fairly well controlled. Yeah. What about his, uh, the Tourette's and depression? Um, that's Risperdone and Sertraline. Are we good with those? Um, did you look up any, because uh, my first thought was some of the, what, what is the, is there any kind of um, data with uh, quetiapine with Tourette's because of the insomnia? Yeah, so when I was um, looking through it, I found very limited data. There wasn't any concrete da data with Seroquel for Tourette's. And the ones I did find, it fo focused mostly on children and adolescents. So I couldn't find like a good, solid um, 
One strong. Exactly. <laughs> like, so, um, Wasn't compelling. Yeah, I, they usually um, recommend like Tapiramate, um, Risperdone. Those were the ones I commonly saw um, for Tourette's treatment. Yeah. See, I would be really so. skeptical with uh, Tapiramate with this patient. Cognitive already issues? Have, yeah, no. already having uh, no hepatic encephalopathy. No way. Yeah. Um, but I feel like the... Now is she having any benefit from the Risperdal, or are you just trying to kill two birds with that, the that, insomnia? That's the thing. I would want to know like, what what were her original yeah. like tics or symptoms yeah. you know, that she was having from that. Um, are they well controlled? Is she having any signs of you know tardive dyskinesia or any mm-hmm. movement disorder, EPS type symptoms based on the Risperdal being more of a? It's the most what do they call it, the most typical atypical, atypical or yeah. some stupid saying. Um, but you know, if the patient's stable. It helps you remember. Good. I know, I know. I don't even want to say it, but I have to. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, if the patient's stable, then probably just leave them on it. But I would still be. I would want to pull and see, like a little bit, dig a little deeper and see if we could find something with Seroquel, or maybe write a case report on it. Now, do we feel like the insomnia could be improved at all by treating the hepatic encephalopathy? Can it be related to and that? The, and the yeah, and the paritis. And the so, issue, you know, um, I just think it would be better treated instead of the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of using the Ben um the Benadryl. But uh I I definitely think it could be. I think it would just be a matter of we wouldn't want to do all this at once, but yeah. we just kinda have that in our back pocket just in case. Um did you guys see the uh it was published in July sixteenth, twenty twenty two this year, um, the meta analysis looking at the compared effects of pharmacological interventions for long term management of insomnia. You see that at all? I think we had talked. I mentioned it in front of you guys, but um, they looked at all of the different. Uh, I feel this is a good time to bring this up, just in case you guys haven't seen this. But um, they basically looked at all the various, um, the orexin inhibitors, the escipiclone, zolpidem, um, the benzodiazepines, uh, doxepin, even, and they basically came to the conclusion that overall, um, escipiclone and lemborexent were the f- uh, most favorable profile, and escipiclone might cause substantial adverse effects. And safety data on lemborexent uh, was, you know, kind of inconclusive, um, but those seemed to be the most. Uh, beneficial as far as symptom relief, hmm. which I've always kind of thought Zolpidem as far as the most That's interesting. So that they weren't even talking about from a safety perspective. They're talking about efficacy. Uh, yeah. Well, favorable profile as far as, yeah, overall, um, cause they had, let's see what they, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, they looked at 170 different trials. That's a lot of trials. Um, and they include, they even included doxolamine and, uh, um, the, uh, sal- um, the Zaloplon. That mm-hmm. really quick acting one, yeah. um, intermediate benzos, long acting benzos, um, and had fewer discontinuations due to any cause. Um, Romaton, guess what? Romaton scored real high. Not <laughs> basically, it's like the lowest uh, thing on the that. And, and uh, I like mel- how you totally faked this out. Oh, scored dang. really high. Just not. Kidding. I yeah, mean, you well, totally got me. Melatonin uh, and and <laughs> and Romaton were no. did terrible in this, but. Um, the Zopaclone caused more dropouts than Zopaclone and um, the orexin inhibitors uh, tended to be um, a little bit uh, better profiles as well. But um, for the the number of individuals with side effects at study endpoint, benzodiazepines, Zopaclone, Zolpidem, and Zopaclone were worse than placebo, doxepin, um, Belsomron, and Zaloplon. So basically... For long-term management, the most ef- the more effective options of placebo were the escipiclone and the uh, lembre- lembrexent. So but Lunexa, from a safety profile, Lunexa, the other ones and, better. And then what is this other one? The it's a, the orexin inhibitor. Have we talked about that one before? I feel like uh, we have. Yeah, we have mentioned it. I think it's fairly new over the last couple of years. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just another orexin in- inhibitor and. It just happens to be better. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And it's, it's more effective. However, it's got more side effects. So it's like one of those, the, okay. the classic. So they do mention that. Then. Yeah. So okay. the, it's all like all the ones that get the least amount of data or the, the least uh, efficacy from the data standpoint looks like they have the best side effect problem. Go figure. Yeah. You fix your, you fix your insomnia, but you're going to have some issues. I know. So it's, uh, it's, it's I still tough. feel like even though it's they say those specific. are, even though they, right, they say those are the most effective, I'd still kind of tend towards somewhat thing in the middle that's like you get some good efficacy but you don't get like crazy side yeah. effects you know what i mean 
And I'm not. And by of, the way, I'm not saying we should start the page on any of these. I'm just saying right. for since we're talking about insomnia, I felt like that was a good time to kind of interject this study because I feel like it was pretty. I mean, any guidance we can get on sleep meds is good yeah. because it's just all really. I don't know. I feel like it's a crapshoot. Yeah, I just believe in deep meditation and yoga. <laughs> <laughs> sleep hygiene. Thank you know, you. I actually I, I did go through a period of sleeplessness in pharmacy school, and you know what um, helped me? What? I would Call lay, of Duty. No. <laughs> I would lay down and I would imagine my morning commute, like in great detail. And then by the time I was like on seventeen, I'm asleep. That's interesting. It's I'm telling like, you, it's kind of like meditate. That would give me terrible anxiety. Uh, well, I wouldn't think about work or anything. I would just like go through the motions of like getting in my car, opening the door, mm-hmm. cranking up the car, pulling out of the driveway, like every individual thing, and like looking at it like in first person or third person. No, first person. Yeah, yeah. I'd be asleep in like a couple huh. minutes. There's no way I could do that without adding a bunch of stuff that would never happen. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I have to whip my car over to save a school bus of children. And then the garbage the truck slams into me. Yeah. And I easily avoid it because I have the reflexes of a mongoose. Uh, and then I'm pretty soon I'm like super hyped up and can't go back to sleep. <laughs> so Jessa, it's to each his own. Uh, it's a moral of that story. Anything else with this patient? Um, I did. I, I know she's being treated with sertraline. I know it's also extensively metabolized by CYP2D6, um, and it also undergoes first pass metabolism. So um, something to monitor would be maybe like potential accumulation if they were to keep increasing the dose for the patient. Yeah, and I think so. Certainly, definitely has some, but I think the ones that I always worry about the most would be like the uh, in as far as two D six interactions and whatnot is the fluoxetine and paroxetine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it really depends on what her yeah. If her, if her depression is controlled and she's not having any issues, I probably would leave it alone. Um, but yeah, just monitoring like you said and just kind of see how things go because hopefully that I mean ideally that would help with some of the anxiety and, and sleep as well if if possible. But, uh, yeah, this is something that you'd have to make some small changes as you go, and especially if uh, the hep C is going to be added in there as far as treatment. Um, you know, you'd want to get that taken care of. The other thing we haven't mentioned either is because this patient has cirrhosis and, you know, it's pretty obvious that they have, you know, advanced liver disease, they need to get an ultrasound of their liver before starting hep C treatment to screen mm-hmm. for hepatocellular carcinoma. Mm-hmm. I don't think we mentioned that yet. No, we didn't. And that, the thing with a cirrhotic patient is they actually need to get one every six months for the rest of their life um, to screen for that, even after the, the hep C has been treated. So that's the other thing is we need to get this patient. Even if we were going to treat this patient in our clinic, we need to get them in with GI because they have to have monitoring, either GI or hepatologist, to kind of monitor them for the rest of their life to make sure that they don't develop uh, HCC. Yep. Because that's something that often gets overlooked, but you need to follow those patients even after the hep C is gone. Yep. So, anything else, Jezza? Uh, I think we're good, except that we haven't talked about the her constipation that she is also complaining about. Well, that's, we, I think we had mentioned the lactulose hopefully can help with that a little bit. And then worst case, you know what? We're adding that pr- prune lax. <laughs> prune lax double dose. Double dose. <laughs> double dose like it's nothing. As it much prune. as you want. I actually did work with a primary care um, doc. Whenever they'd come in and talk about constipation, he'd say two prunes a day. That's what mm. he'd say. Mm. Two prunes a day. That's what he'd say. Thanks, Beauregard. <laughs> 1920s mustache. Two prunes a day and a cup of sugar. <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. That was my weird old person. <laughs> I have no idea what I just offering your body sugar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to have diabetes. <laughs> no, it just seems like such a uh, old school remedy. You know what? When our little dudes got constipation, you know what we give them? Mm. Uh, pureed don't prunes. You, don't say it. Pureed prunes. prunes. Don't you prune I'm me serious. wrong, Cole. I'm serious. That's going to make me furious. And when he's got diarrhea, we do brat diet. You know, the bananas, I'm, the apples. Have you tried the opposite to see what happens? No. <laughs> so so you don't have any data. I have not tried the opposite. Unbelievable. Cole's not a real scientist, guys. That's what we could learn from this. All right. So I guess we'll wrap this up since we're just talking nonsense. Everybody else is probably gone by a long time now. Um and, uh, you know, the thing we haven't really mentioned yet, but I do want to make sure we take time to thank our sponsor of the podcast, Pearls. Um, it, they have some great new material out on their on their app and the website. So Pearls, P-Y-R-L-S dot com slash core consult Rx. Sign up for a free account. Check it out. See if you like it. And then if you're if you're a professional, you might want to go ahead and upgrade um, to the full app. Um, a lot of good stuff. They're adding adding new content every single month. And um, we really appreciate all the the, the love and support 
support we get from them and um, for continuing to sponsor the podcast. Um, and we have some new accredited episodes coming out on the 8th of August. It's going to be a double a dose. Double dose. We're doing pulmonary arterial hypertension and COPD. Look at us actually knowing what we're doing ahead. <laughs> That's never been done in the history of this podcast. <laughs> Jess, this is groundbreaking. You witnessed it I'm here. I'm so proud of you. I thank you. <laughs> and uh, so basically, uh, well, yeah, we're, we're growing up. Cole, good for us. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I feel happy. Don't cool. know what to say about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, if you guys have any questions for us, emails on the show notes. You can reach us on social media. The the text messaging platform that you can utilize is also in the show notes. Check out Patreon if you want more traditional lecture styles, you know, pharmacotherapy practice questions, and not any of us fooling around for the most part. I might throw occasional nonsense in there, but most of it's traditional lecture style. And uh, so that's patreon.com slash core consult rx. And uh, we appreciate the support. Appreciate you guys listening. We'll catch you guys in the next episode. Have a great night. Bye. 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 All right. Let me shut off the stream. Thanks, everybody listening.